Two weeks ago today, I ran my fastest 10K time ever. I ran 32 minutes and 32 seconds. And this was a PB that has escaped me for six years. Six years ago, I ran 32, 33, and I haven't even been able to get close to that time since. And I ran faster by one second in a 10K that had only three weeks worth of training in front of it. I'd literally been running for three weeks after the marathon, easy running. Then I did three weeks of actual workouts, what I would call proper training. So how did I run faster than my PB, which had way more work in front of it than that? I'm gonna break it all down today. How I think I ran that, how the race went, and how I think I ran it super smart this time around to get the most out of myself. And I'm also gonna talk about why the 10K has been my nemesis ever since I ran that fastest time six years ago. It's a classic race recap video, and I'm really excited for this one. But first, I need to go for my long run. So let's go and get the work done. And stick around for some exciting news about merch later on this video, especially if you're one of the people that missed out when we dropped the merch a couple of weeks ago, and it sold out in two days. Ooh, nice ass. That was such a gross run. Sometimes I can do it on days where it's just disgusting outside and it's windy and it's rainy, but sometimes I get in my own head and I'm just like, I hate this, but I'm gonna do it. Not the most motivating thing to hear, but if you feel like that too, you're not alone. So the trusty Trafford 10K, that's where I ran my PB just two weeks ago. And it's also where I ran my last 10K before doing this race. So that was funnily enough, exactly a year ago. And well, in the video itself, I think I was pretty pleased. Like on the day, I was happy with my performance. Kind of how I raced it. I, I just went with the girls at the start. But actually on reflection, when I look at the splits of that run activity back on the data that I have from my watch, I ran like an absolute idiot. That's not because I was super unfit. I think I probably could have run faster than that time last year if I hadn't have gone out as hard as I did and blown up because I ran pretty fast at the start and then ran pretty slow at the end. And that's nothing to do with where my training's at, right? That's not reflective of my fitness. That's totally mental and my mental approach to the race. Now, I've spoken in my race recap videos before how important the mental side of running is and how I've worked on my mental approach and my sporting mentality with a sports psychologist to really take charge of that inner voice that you're hearing in training and in races. And most importantly, to try and shut down the negative and self-sabotaging thoughts. And later on in this video, I'll talk about what my mental approach was to this race and why I think that was ultimately one of the reasons I was able to get the absolute most out of my performance on that day. But before I do that, I wanna talk about one of the things that has gotten me into a really good place with my mental health, and that is therapy. This video is a paid partnership with BetterHelp, and I would love to talk to you for just a moment about their service and what working with a therapist can do for you. My mental health has been a little turbulent at times, which I'm sure is the case for most of us. Life throws things at us that are unexpected or complicated or difficult to deal with, and we suffer as a result because it's hard to process. It's hard to carry on with your day-to-day -day stuff that's not just gonna go away whilst you're struggling at the same time. For me, acknowledging that I was struggling in the past and talking to someone close to me really helped. And another thing that has really helped has been working with a therapist. And often starting this process can be the first step in starting to feel a little bit better or just even a tiny bit more in control of things. Now I'm not saying it's easy. Starting therapy can be really, really hard. A lot of people I know have struggled to find the right therapist or even just feel uncomfortable at the idea of face-to-face -face therapy sessions. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even even just via messaging, if you prefer that to start off with. Whatever is the most comfortable version of therapy for you. I've shared a link in my description, and essentially to get started, you fill out a questionnaire, 
questionnaire to help assess your specific needs. And then you'll get matched with a credentialized therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. One of the things that I think is so great about BetterHelp is that you can schedule your therapy sessions for whenever it works for you. And if you don't fit with the therapist that you're first matched with, which is super common when starting therapy, you can easily switch to another therapist at no additional cost. Over 4 million people have used BetterHelp to start living a healthier and happier life. So if you think you'd benefit from therapy too, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash Philly Bowden. And clicking this link both helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. So to elaborate on what I mean by the fact that I ran like an idiot, and it was all to do with what was going on up here rather than what my legs were able to do. Um, here's my splits from the race. Now, I appreciate these are in miles. That's the settings on my watch. Did I run a 507 first mile? Yeah, yeah I did. Is that faster than any mile I ran this year at Trafford? When I ran half a minute faster? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And did I finish basically at marathon pace with a 5.30 mile? Yeah. I ran like an idiot, guys. And it's the biggest mistake we make, which is going out too hard and too fast, either... Oops, I just spilled some Biscoff. Either because your ego is not in your pocket, you're wearing it on your chest, or you get caught up in the adrenaline and the rush of the start and that carries on for far too long. We're gonna start fast off the line. I get that there's a bit of panic and nervous energy, but you have to let that happen and then reel it in and remember your race plan. And um, I didn't do that last year. This golf after the long run just hits different. If the white bread police are after me, I should be fearing for my life now. Ooh. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do, mate? Don't worry, that's not my only post-run nutrition <laughs> that I'm gonna get. It was just, it was just what my veins needed to start off with. <gasps> I've got chocolate milk. And this is not just any chocolate milk. This is chocomel. We're gonna get some ASMR chocolate milk opening. Chocomel, my DMs are open. <sighs> Where was I? So last year I ran too fast. I was only like five or six seconds off my road PB last year. So my road PB up until Trafford of this year was 32.55. From December 2021, when I was like a month into my first marathon block for Seville, I haven't looked back at that run's data, but I, I know that I ran that race like an idiot as well because it was at Telford 10K, which if you've ever run Telford in the UK, it's a downhill start. It's a very tight line and um, it encourages people to start the race too fast, it brackets like an idiot. And I can remember looking at my watch in that race and it was definitely like 5.0 something or 5.10, which is going to be a lot, a lot faster than the average pace for that whole race. So I think thinking about that and thinking about how I ran Trafford last year and looking at the data gave me the knowledge that I don't think I've ever got it right in a road 10K, which gave me the incentive to get it right this time and to, you know, try something different and see if it comes off. And also gave me some confidence that I didn't get the most of myself out of those 10K races previously. So I might be able to run faster now, even though I'm less fit than I was then, if I run the race super smart versus running like Philly of old. Stay with me. And I also went in with the knowledge that pretty much all of my PBs, apart from Houston Marathon, which I'm not gonna say doesn't count, it does count, it was a PB, but it was so small of a PB that I only just managed. Everything bar that and my marathon PB beforehand, I'd run them as negative splits, like good races. On the track, my 10K fastest all time, I picked up into that race. 5Ks that I've done. Okay, the half marathon's an exception as well. Another race where I ran like an idiot. But where I've run a PB and I've not negative split has been in a race where there was so much room for improvement that I could run like an idiot or go out too fast and still sneak a PB, but still not reach my potential on that day, if that makes sense. 
And before I talk about the race this year and take you through how I made sure that I ran super smart, how I paced it, what I was kind of thinking I'd get out of it, but my mental approach more so than anything, I feel like it's only right to talk about the PB that stood for so long before I was able to break it with this race. And that was the 32-33 that I ran on the track so technically it's still my track 10K PB, but I ran it six years ago, guys, in 2018, before the Super Spike era, I will have you know. So 32, 33 pre-Super Spikes, I was wearing like Nike Matumbos, just this little little piece of, you couldn't even call it foam. That's gotta be worth like, I don't know, at least a second a lap these days. What do they call it? Like a four or 5% improvement? It's gotta be worth like a 31, 50 something. That was the 10K PB I ran at the Highgate Harriers Night of the 10K PBs, AKA the best race ever, which by the way, I'm very excited to go back to this year in May. Well, what an iconic race, what a day. I'm actually gonna have a shower and eat some proper food because I wanna do this one justice. So I'm gonna sit down and talk you through it properly, P properly. Otherwise I'm just gonna get really cold and I stink. I appreciate you can't smell me, but I can, all right? And it needs a dressing, so let's go. That's better. So that PB, that one race that has kind of haunted me, but I shouldn't say that because it was one of my favorite races that I've ever run. It's up there in one of my top five, probably best, most exhilarating, core memory level running experiences because I completely surprised myself and it was just an amazing day, an amazing night of racing. I've actually made a bit of a longer video on the 10k training that led up to this race and why it was a little bit problematic because I wasn't in a very good place at the time and I was just going through a few things which meant that I wasn't putting my body first and kind of trashing myself which which you kind of think should mean that I shouldn't have run as well as I did but I think it's that kind of short-lived success that then if you carry on with that kind of dysfunction it doesn't doesn't reap the rewards for much longer than that. So go and check that out. I'll link it up here. Um, but essentially, yeah, I was aiming to run 33 minutes or just under when I went into that Highgate Harriers night of the 10K PBs in 2018. It was also the European Cup. So you had six representatives for different European countries racing for this European Cup championship as well. I didn't get selected for the GB team, but uh, that's okay because it went so well that from about halfway in, I had my splits written on my hand. I looked down and I realized that I was well under pace for this 33 minute time. Now, that's not the same as going out too quick because I'd gone out on pace and just started to pick it up and pick it up and pick it up. So I thought, I don't really need to pay much attention to the splits on my hand, I'm just gonna race this. And I started picking people off and started moving through. I ended up coming second in the British Championships of that race, so I beat five out of the six girls that were running for Great Britain in that race, in me old shot vest. And I came fifth overall. Yeah, ran 32, 33, blew my expectations out of the water. And I actually wish that kind of in hindsight, I had set my goals a little bit higher because had I maybe aimed for around 32, 30, I might have run that 3.3 seconds quicker that I needed to automatically qualify for the European Championships. Slight regrets there, but anyway, I hadn't run faster than that over 10K on the track all the road for six years until two weeks ago. And maybe part of the reason that I wasn't gunning for a PB at this year's Trafford 10K is because I didn't believe it would happen because it hasn't happened for so long. Does that make sense? I've definitely gone into other 10Ks thinking, right, I'm gonna run quicker than 32, 33, or even I wanna run 32 flat and it's just not come off. And I think sometimes the pressure can make it harder. But equally, I had literally done two and a half, three weeks of easy runs after Houston Marathon and then got back into three weeks worth of sessions. And these are really like easing in sessions. My first workout back was five sets of three minutes, two minutes, one minute. And I ran most of those reps at marathon pace. And it was really hard. <laughs> I did some long tempo work, but nothing sexy fast, nothing impressive, nothing to make me think I'm in serious shape here, I could run a PB. And so going into the race, what was I thinking I wanted to get out of it? 
what was I thinking the purpose of this race is? I'm a big believer that every race you do should have a purpose. That purpose can be just to have some fun and get in a race and get a little bit more out of yourself than in training. And that's a little bit of what the purpose was this time around. I didn't really see it as a fitness tester because like I said, I knew that my fitness wasn't right up here. I hadn't worked on it a lot with the sessions that I'd done. And so the purpose was just to get in a race, have a rust buster and to have a race experience between the Houston Marathon in January and my next race, which is the Berlin Half in April. And so my thinking was, let's get the most out of this for me and where I'm at and run my own race. Not think about what the people around me are doing, not go out with the other girls and try and stick with them for as long as I can. Really run the smart race for me and where I'm at, which is where the data from last year came in, looked at that and thought, hmm, you idiot. <laughs> Let's not do that this time around. Let's learn from it and maybe feel like we have a little more at the end to give. Because listen, I could have run the exact same time I ran last year, 33-ish minutes, and just swapped my splits around. I could have started at 5.30 and finished at 5.07. If I can do it the, from going fast to slow, I can do it the other way around. And it would have been a lot more enjoyable, I can guarantee. And with the knowledge in mind that last time I ran the half marathon in Copenhagen, I did the same thing. I started off too fast. I got caught up with what other people around me were doing and I just ran at a pace I couldn't sustain. So to set the precedent to not do that in Berlin, I thought, let's get that practice in today and let's negative split. Let's start out at a pace that I know I can at least maintain, but hopefully build on. And guys, I followed the assignment. That is exactly what I did. I'm so proud of myself. Because you can write out a plan and you can say, this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm sure a lot of you watching this can relate. And then you go and do the exact opposite. <laughs> I've seen it in the athletes I coach as well. They've said, you know, I'm gonna definitely take it easy from the start because I've definitely not done that in the past and I wanna learn from that. And then you get to the race and the start line is really hectic, it's really exciting and everyone goes and you go and you feel great and then after a mile, you're like, crap, that was too fast. And I didn't do that. <laughs> Yay! So let's have a look at the data to marry that up with what I'm talking about here. First mile, and Daniel's gonna be an absolute gem and he's gonna write the kilometer pace conversion. Just here, for all of you weirdos that measure in Ks. Just kidding, I love you. First mile, 5.15. Lovely. Very good, we love to see it. 5.15 is the average pace needed to run a 32.37, which interestingly enough, is what my watch predicted I would run. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, go over there for um, an entertaining, recap on the race where I was in competition with my watch, who I also named Cordelia because Cordelia the Chorus. Anyway, in comparison to last year, 515, 507, that's a pretty good improvement. Yes, I'm running slower, but that is literally what I wanted to do. Run slower at the start, so I didn't run slower at the end. And I'm really proud of myself because this Trafford 10K is a very um, slim start line. I was about four or five rows back kind of behind the men, so it took three or four seconds before I could even get through the start line. And then when you've got a lot of runners around you at the start, you're kind of wanting to pick it up to get away from everyone and to that point where it thins out and you know, you're just starting the race, you feel pretty fresh. So it would have been really easy for me to run 5.0 something and then to crash and burn after that. And then uh, call me queen of consistency, mile two, 5.15 again. And if you forgot what that conversion is to kilometers, here it is once more. And that felt good. I looked at my watch when that split came up and it was a really nice sort of reassurance to myself that I'd started off at the right pace because I was matching it. However, mile three was a little bit slower. Now, this course is set up for a negative split because there are a few little inclines in the first half because you go over the canal, you basically go over a couple of bridges. And then in the second half, you're coming down back to the village. So the third mile being a little bit slower is, is pretty predictable. So we're feeling good at this point, but 
10Ks are very painful and it was starting to hurt from the 5K point onwards, which I'd say is, is about right. If you're not starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable at 5K in, you probably could have gone a bit faster at the start, but you shouldn't feel like you're dying. And I don't think I felt like that. I just felt like it was, it was hard. Good thing about this race is that it's very dense. Like there's a lot of depth in the competitors in this race. It had a lot of guys around me for company, which was super helpful. And it just, it just helps when you've got someone in front of you to aim for or someone beside you to try and stick with. It's just, it's so much nicer than running on your own. Fourth mile, we picked it up. 512, baby. Come on. Again, it does look elevation related because last year I ran 517 versus to the 527 before that, so 10 seconds quicker. Um, I was using that decrease in elevation. Decrease in elevation? Is there a word for that? De-elevation? Elevation loss, that's the one. And that's important to do. Look, if you're gonna do a hilly 10K, relax up the hills a little bit. Don't try and maintain the same pace that you're running on the flat on the uphill because that's a surefire way to die a death, let the hill come to you. But then if you're on the downhill, eat it up, baby. Open up your stride, let gravity do its thing and equal out that time difference, would be my advice if your 10K is hilly. Also though, just don't run a hilly 10K, <laughs> run a flat one. Why would you wanna run a hilly one? So we're two thirds of the race done at this point. We're kind of getting to the point where we've nearly got 3K to go. And that is the worst part of a 10K, I think. Obviously at 7K, you've got less running in your legs than at 8K, so it, it gets harder. Well, obviously. For me, it's that, it's that kind of two thirds to three quarters point where you're like, ah, this is really hard, but I still have quite a long time left. And I think it mentally is quite difficult. So you have to give yourself a bit of a talking to, which I did. I said, come on, this isn't lost. You've got this, grid it up, love the grind, baby, and uh, break it down. Get to the next K marker, get to the next mile beep on your watch. So my fifth mile, we got back to 5.15, where we started. Happy days. Oh, man. And then the last mile of this race, it is a long mile, I'm telling you. You can almost see the finish from about a mile away. You feel like the next turn is gonna be the penultimate turn, and then it's not because the whole of the course from a mile to go just looks the same. There's like a right turn and then another right turn and then another right turn and oh, they were teasing us. And this is where I had a very encouraging competitor help me out, which so lovely. We actually had someone comment saying who it was so I can give him a shout out. Carl Moulton, Bow Alloy, Bow Alloy, Bow Alloy, Bow Alloy. It's a running club in Congleton. Not Congleton Harriers. I thought it was Congleton Harriers because it said Congleton on his back. Very misleading. But Carl, you're an absolute legend. And uh, 62 people at least agree with me because your friend Martin Bailey that left a comment, 62 people liked it. You see it? You see it there? This guy was selflessly encouraging me whilst I'm sure he wasn't feeling fantastic either unless he was just out for an absolute jolly jog and just holding back and could have run way faster. Either way, I appreciate it. He was giving me the good vibe, saying, come on, hold that pace, you've got it, nearly there. I, I actually can't remember what he was saying. It was just so painful, but it was really helpful. <laughs> and then I was able to dig right into the depths of whatever was left in my legs and around 5.14 last mile, which again, pretty close to the average pace for the whole run. Also have you know, I have here the data on the last 0.2 miles because yeah, 10K is 6.2 miles. 4.56 pace. Ha, coach, put me in the 800, I'm ready. I'm so fast. Oh, it's horrible though. 10Ks are horrible. I love them, but I hate them and I love to hate them. When it goes right, it's great. But if it goes right, you've got to get the most out of yourself in those last 3K and it's so painful. It just hits different. Now, of course, different strategies work for different people and I would 100% encourage you to find out what works for you. A lot of people want to run evens the whole way through. I've met people that will say, I categorically cannot negative split. I always go out hard and I see how much I can hang on. And that time at the start is me banking time. I disagree because it sounds like you're just running the way that you've always run and we're creatures of habit. 
I think everyone can negative split and I do think it's the best way to run your races. Most of the world records are run as negative splits. Most of the best performances that are winning these races are negative splits because if you pace yourself at the start and have something left to pick it up, you're gonna get the most out of yourself because you're just gonna absolutely kill that last couple of kilometers, the last couple of miles and pick it up and run as fast as you possibly can to the finish versus if you just over egg it a little bit at the start, it can just, it can just ruin your whole race. So my advice would be to start off conservatively. I would hazard a guess that if you run your first mile or 2K at half marathon pace and then let yourself pick it up after that, you still won't run as quick for that next kilometer as you would have run from the start if you hadn't have held yourself back, which is a good thing because you're pacing yourself. We like to pace it. Love the grind, but love it gently over the course of a race. <laughs> Does that make sense? And then it's, it's just such a more positive way to run. Picking it up and picking those people off that did run like idiots, that are positive splitting. Oh, it feels so good, baby. That's free bait. Those are free prey, in fact. People that you can pick off and storm past them in the second half or at the finish. And if you're one of those people, I'm sorry, but um, you're important too. Come over to the dark side, the good side, the light side. Is that what the opposite of the dark side is? Before I go, merch. I promised I'd tell you about merch. We launched the merch a few weeks ago and we were shooketh at how quickly it sold out and especially how quickly certain sizes sold out. So I had women messaging me after about 20 minutes saying, Philly, what are you playing at? My size is sold out. And I was like, I'm sorry, Sandra, but it's gone. We had to make some guesswork on ordering of the sizes. We didn't get it completely right. And I don't think we had a good enough range of sizes because I also had some messages from people that were really unhappy that we didn't stock their size. And I'm not proud of that, but we have a solution, guys. We are going to reopen the merch site from today for 10 days. Now, it's gonna be a pre-order format. What does that mean? You can buy whatever you want in whatever size. We can make it happen, but we are gonna close the website after 10 days and then put the order in with our supplier, which means it'll take approximately eight to 10 weeks to get it to you. I realize that's a long time, but see it as like a second Christmas or a a gift to your future self. I hope the people that missed out see this as a good solution. The alternative is that we just order a bunch of stuff again and open the website in eight to 10 weeks, but I want to make sure that people get what they want. So if you're interested, if you missed out, check out the website, the link is in the description. You can order any size of the sports kit. We're only going with the PB Run Club t-shirts and vests because those were the most popular. I'm excited to give you another drop. And once again, just huge thanks to those that purchased last time around. It was a big rush packing the orders and writing all the thank you cards, but it's been so, so lovely seeing all of your photos, people tagging me in videos of them racing and running in their new kit. And it feels just surreal seeing people wear the stuff that we put loads of work in to make. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Check it all out at phillybowdenmerch.com. And if you have a 10K race coming up soon, Good bloody luck, let me know how it goes and make sure that you remember to love the grind.